Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I'm David Morrow with the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University in Washington, DC. And we are joined today by Derek Lemoyne, an associate professor of economics at the University of Arizona, uh, to talk about his paper, Incentivizing Negative Emissions Through Carbon Shares. Uh, before we get started, a few logistical notes. Uh, participants will remain muted throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar today. If you do have questions for Derek, please do use the Q&A function here in Zoom to ask your questions, and then I will moderate those questions um, after Derek's presentation and some discussion from us. So to set a little bit of context here, uh, when I talk with people about carbon removal, uh, one of the first things that they want to know is how much is it going to cost, followed immediately by who is going to pay for it. And I've got this long answer, but it ends up leading to, in the long run, if we want net negative emissions, here's what I usually say, it looks like the government is going to have to pay for it. It will be paid for out of tax revenues. And Derek is here to tell us why I am wrong. So take it away, Derek. Thank you. That's a, a great introduction. And I actually don't know that you're wrong, because um, that may be what happens in the long run. It just doesn't have to be that way, is what I'm going to tell you. Um, so it's it's actually a hard problem. Like when you start thinking about it. So first, thank you, David, for the introduction and for the invitation. It's it, I'm really uh, fortunate to present to this group, because you all know a lot of things about negative emissions or removal that I don't know and have thought about it a lot more. So I'm very much looking forward to your feedback. Um, so when you start thinking about how to incentivize negative emissions, it turns out to be a thornier problem than one might think at first. And it's, it's interesting that it's escaped a common attention by and large, at least um, up to now. So some quick background. Um, by and large, when economists think about climate policy, the first thing that we think about is either taxing emissions or putting a cap on emissions and let, letting the market find the right price for emissions. To first approximation, these two things are equivalent. They're putting a price in emissions and they're basically the same thing, um, absent some technicalities. Um, so we think about pricing emissions and the way that typically works, if, you have, if you're emitting in 2021, um, you're choosing whether to emit and pay a price. Here are the illustrations in the form of a tax, but it could be in the form of needing to obtain a permit in the cap and trade market, or you're thinking about paying to not emit by installing some other kind of technology. In 2050, once you, if you decide to emit, you have carbon dioxide hanging around in the atmosphere still. If you didn't emit, you know, nothing's going on. There's no carbon in the atmosphere. In 2050, you presumably, when you're deciding whether to emit in, in that period or 2040 or 2030, whatever the year might be, you have the same set of options. Um, but by that time, you know, a realistic option would also be to just emit and simultaneously remove your carbon and avoid either purchasing a permit or, or paying a tax near emissions uh, in, the, in the same fashion. So it works like you know, just not emitting period. I wanna emphasize that there's no problem incentivizing this use of carbon removal through emission taxes or caps. The fact that there's a price in emissions gives you the incentive to avoid paying that price by just removing your carbon simultaneously and offsetting your emissions as they occur. What it, an emission uh, price through a tax or a cap does not do is give you the incentive to use carbon removal to take care of your old emissions, to deal with the case where you have carbon still floating up there in 2050 from 2021, you've paid the whole penalty up front. You turned in your permit in 2021. You bought it and paid for it and got rid of it. You paid the tax in 2021. There's no incentive to actually pay the price to pull the carbon back out of the air when 2050 comes around. So this is a hole in, in commonly proposed policies that we kind of take as given or the best thing that a government could do. Um, and the whole is that if negative emissions are the right thing to do, should they become optimal because damages are high or removal gets cheap, whatever the case may be, these policies can't get there unless the government were to just directly pay for it. So the question of the paper is how can we incentivize net negative emissions? So as David mentioned, the government could just directly pay for it. Um, but there's some work suggesting the scale of the subsidies could be quite large. It also might not be a dependable source of funding for the market, which may lead, lead to underinvestment and innovation and things like that. So it's it worth thinking about, are there, does the government have to pay for it? Do taxpayers have to pay for it? Or is there another way around the problem? 
So can we incentivize both optimal emissions and removal? We don't want to lose the fact that we know how to get the right level of emissions. We want to keep that and add on the possibility of getting the right level of carbon removal without requiring net spending from the government or from taxpayers. So just brief history, the recommendation for emission pricing for climate change goes way back to the earliest work in economics on climate change. Um, I've seen very little on, on how to incentivize negative emissions. I know that there are a couple of things, I, I at least now know, because David just mentioned that there's one or two things that have come out in the last couple of months, it sounds like. Um, if you know of other work on how to incentivize negative emissions beyond just kind of waving hands and saying, we'll subsidize it, um, please send it to me because I, I don't doubt somebody's thought about it and written on it. I just haven't been able to find it yet. Um, so I would definitely like to know. So one thing you could do, as kind of the most obvious thing you could do, um, is, is right now emission, the standard emission pricing policy is kind of mismatched with climate change. So if we're, we talk about taxing the flow of emissions into the atmosphere, which makes sense if the harm from emissions was basically from that flow. But with climate change, the harm is from the accumulated stock. So instead of taxing the flow, which is kind of irrelevant to the climate problem, maybe we should just tax the stock of carbon in the atmosphere, with the idea being that as you emit, you kind of like own a, own a piece of the carbon in the sky and you pay a tax on that property for as long as you leave it up there. And now you have an incentive to pull it back out in order to avoid paying the tax. So now there's a reason why you might want to pay for air capture or carbon removal, because now you're still paying a tax in 2050 if you choose to leave your carbon up there. And I show mathematically, you can make this policy work better than, than the an emission price policy, where you get the right emission incentives and get the right carbon removal incentives. The problem is that carbon hangs around in the atmosphere for a very long time. This isn't like a five or 10 year problem. And on the decades that it may take to, to get to the point where undoing our year 2021 emissions, there's a lot of market churn that happens. And it doesn't have to be nefarious. It's just that business, business change and industries change. We see that all the time. Think of the big companies from 50 years ago and how many of them are just no longer here. Um, and if you're out of business, then you're not there to pay the tax on the carbon in the atmosphere. You could set up more complicated schemes, but you know, you're gonna have to, to find a workaround around that. And nobody's gonna wanna be the one to assume that liability. The whole point of bankruptcy is to shed liabilities. Um, so the, the trick of the paper is how can we avoid needing taxpayers to spend the carbon removal? And how can we do it in a way that's not vulnerable to companies just going out of business to avoid it? Because they might be accumulating big liabilities as they emit, and there's an incentive just, just to shed those liabilities at some later point by either disappearing, or it may just be they happen to disappear even you know, without planning to. So the proposal in the paper is a brand new type of policy that, um, that I just got to make up a name for it, uh, and I called it carbon shares. And the idea is going to be that you basically are responsible for a share of the carbon in the atmosphere. These are going to be trans a new type of financial asset. They're going to be transferable, and each one is going to be attached to a unit of carbon that was emitted. So in a picture, um, there's an emitter, you know, in time T, let's say in 2021, and they're going to post a bond to the government, to the regulator. And this is a bond not in the sense of corporate debt, not in the sense of like things that you buy uh, from the treasury or from Apple and they pay you interest on it. This is a bond more in like the older sense of like a jail bond, like a deposit, which I'll come back to that terminology. So you post a bond to the regulator, but it's not just that you post a bond, you get something back from the regulator and you get this carbon share. And I'll, I'll describe in a few minutes what that does. For now, taken on faith, this carbon share is gonna have some value and taken on faith that that value is gonna be less than the bond. And it'll be, I think, clear later why that is. So you can immediately then turn around and sell this carbon share on. You don't have to hold on to it. You can if you want to. You can also just sell it on into a market. Presumably there would ideally be a liquid market for these things and you can just get the, get the money back. So your actual incentive to reduce emissions is the gap between the bond you have to post and the value of the share you get in return. The money you lose from emitting is that difference. And that's the difference that, that we'll come back to when I talk about how do you get the right level of emissions. So what does a carbon share do in the future? That's where all the action is, and that's what determines the value of the share. There's two possibilities. So fast forward to some future time T plus S, let's call it 2050, um, the, and imagine your carbon's still up there in the atmosphere. So the carbon share is basically, has basically has a piggy bank attached to it. In the initial period in 2021, the amount of money in that piggy bank is the bond. Like you basically fill that piggy bank up with the bond that you posted. 
And if that carbon is still up there in 2050, the regulator is going to take some money out of the piggy bank um, in the form of damage charges. And I'll describe shortly how it, would, how it should set those if it's behaving as best as it could. Um, and then some of that money is going to flow to the people who own the shares, whoever the shareholders happen to be, could be the original emitters, could be anybody. They're going to receive the dividend out of the piggy bank. And I'll describe how that should be set. And then the piggy bank is going to just continue into the future. And then in 2051, the same thing would happen. And in 2052, the same thing would happen, et cetera. The other possibility is that at some future time, again, let's just go with 2050, you choose to, instead of leaving your carbon in the atmosphere, you actually pay for carbon removal, whatever the future price of removal happens to be. So now you're paying some costs to suck your carbon back out of the atmosphere. The share is then retired and the entire piggy bank is cashed out and given back to the shareholder. So basically your two options are either I leave my carbon in the atmosphere, I take a dividend, I lose some of the piggy bank to a damage charge, and I kind of let this happen over and over and over. Or at some point, I kind of call game on the whole problem. I pay for carbon removal and I get back the entire value of the piggy bank. So formally, the way, the way we think about this is that removing carbon is exercising an option. So like you think about a financial option, it's the right but not the obligation to let's say buy a stock at a certain price by some future date. If the price of the stock ends up really high and you have the right to buy it at a cheap level, great, you're, you're doing good, you're in the money, you do it. If the price of the stock ends low, you just walk away and you don't take any losses. So options are valuable in the sense that you can avoid taking losses while you can get upside if things work out well. Here, your options basically, you're comparing the payoff from, from carbon removal, which is receiving the entire value in the piggy bank minus the cost of removal, which could be higher, it could be low, depending on how the world shakes out. You're comparing that to the cost of just holding the share for one more period and getting the dividend in the next period and making the same decision in the following period. And mathematically, we have to solve that problem to figure out when should you remove carbon in order to figure out the value of the share. Um, so I won't go through that gory detail, but I will give you insight into how one, and into the best possible way the regulator should set policy. So some brief background. So when economists think about climate policy, we're typically, the first thing that we think about is what we call welfare maximizing policy. So there's some welfare or utility function, some benefit function for all of society. Um, climate change is kind of causing losses out into the future. And we're trying to think, what is the tax today that's going to maximize well-being now and all the way out into the future? And what, how does this tax evolve over time? The standard recommendation is that the tax on unit of emissions today or the price in a cap and trade program is going to be the same. Um, it should be equal to the additional damage from emitting today in every future year. So we emit today, one more unit today, we cause extra damage in every future year, as long as the carbon's in the atmosphere, so effectively forever. Um, and then we look at what that damage could be under every possible state of the world. So whether climate change ends up bad, damages are high, climate change ends up not as bad, damages are low. We take, we average over these possibilities and then we basically convert it all to present dollars and just add everything up. So you're looking at the present expected value of future additional or what we call marginal damage from now all the way out into the future from today's emissions. We call that the social cost of carbon. This is the number the US government is currently trying to recalculate. Um, it's started in the Obama administration, it got recalculated in the Trump administration, it's being recalculated again. And it's meant to be the social harm from carbon emissions, which is the harm that's missing from the market price of emissions if, if we didn't have policy, and which policy is trying to put back into the market price of emissions. So with, with that background, what, what should, how does this policy relate? So first I show that the damage charge um, should be just the current damage from past emissions. So in 2050, the damage charge is the, the, whatever the damages in 2050 actually really end up being. So not projecting out into the future, just looking at data in 2050, backing out how much climate change costs the economy and then charging the year 2021 emissions for that damage. Um, so it, it's kind of, it's a small piece of what we typically are looking to calculate. And we can actually do this from kind of current data rather than projecting out the 2100 and 2200 and thinking about losses from climate change. So as the world goes on, the regular, you know, it's almost like the Fed estimating inflation. It'd be some government agency estimating damage. Ideally, there'd be a standard method to do this and then just posting the number and that's kind of coming out of the, out of the piggy bank. What should the bond be 
So I mentioned that the emission price should be the expected damage out into the future from additional emissions today. The bond should be the worst case possible damages all the way out into the future. And the idea is that the piggy bank has to be big enough to fund any possible sequence of damage charges that you might need to fund. And I'll come back to how big that actually might need to be in practice. Um, and so how big, what's, the, what's the, wor the largest possible sequence of damage charges you need to fund? is whatever the worst case scenario for climate change would be. In practice, climate change is unlikely uh, to be the absolute worst case. <laughs> it's almost surely gonna be better than that and possibly a lot better than that. So then the question is, what do you do with the difference? And that's where the dividend comes in. So the dividends are basically refunding the difference between whatever you thought the worst case was going to be and whatever actually ended up happening in each future year. So 2050 comes along, we had a worst case estimate that was part of the bond. We see what damages actually were, which could be good, could be bad, but probably not worst case. And then we return the difference to the shareholders. And the key thing I would emphasize is bankruptcy is not an issue here. Um, the share is valuable. Once you've posted the bond and you've received the share in return, there's no more cost to holding a share. Either you can keep holding it and receive a dividend, or you can choose to remove carbon and receive what's left of the piggy bank. But you only do that if that looks attractive. You don't do that if the cost of moving carbon is more than the value in the piggy bank, because otherwise you can sit there and just keep receiving dividends. So bankruptcy is not an issue. Um, if people, if a firm that owns shares or any individual who owns shares goes bankrupt, somebody is going to want to claim that and pick that back up. The court would want to allocate that like any other asset. The key thing, um, which is sort of the mathematical run of the paper, I'll give you intuition for. Um, is how do, uh, how do the emission incentives play out uh, or the emission and removal incentives? So first I show nicely that you don't do any worse than a standard policy with emission incentives. We're not sacrificing on that front. So the, I show that the gap between the bond and the value of the share you receive is the expected social cost of carbon. It's just the, if you think about what you're losing over time is the expected damage charges and those damage charges are set to whatever damages end up being then basically your, the cost of, of emitting is the, the damage charges you expect to lose. That's expected damage from emissions. That's the right emission price. You're doing the, exactly the same thing as an emission tax. What's different is who's calculating those charges. And I'll come back to that um, near the end of the talk. So I think that's really critical. The other is, which is new, is that now you have optimal removal incentives. So first best in economics means kind of the best you could do. So if the government's behaving as rationally as it can and maximizing welfare, this is the best policy could do. An emission tax does not get first best removal if net negative emissions are optimal because you need a subsidy. Um, here, you do get first best removal because if you think about what you're doing, why do you want to remove carbon from the atmosphere? Well, you're comparing my ability to pull the whole piggy bank out today to my ability to sit back and keep receiving damage, uh, dividends and losing damage charges. My benefit of pulling everything out now is avoiding losing all the future damage charges. So I'm comparing the cost of removing carbon today to the benefit of not losing all the future damage charges, which is really just the expected future cost from leaving my emissions in the atmosphere, the expected future social cost. So I'm, com I'm, I'm removing carbon only when the cost of carbon removal is lower then the remaining harm from leaving my carbon in the atmosphere. So only if carbon removal gets cheap or the harm looks really big. That's exactly the right social calculation. Um, so you're, you're in, we're, we've gotten to, if we had a universal dictator, this is what the dictator should want to do. Um, the market's gonna, gonna get back to that solution. And that's kind of the whole trick of the papers to get there. One easier way to think about this is maybe as a deposit refund instrument. So you see deposit refunds sometimes in trash programs. You see it um, sometimes with like aluminum cans or, or milk bottles. You can bring them back and get a refund, but you, you're getting a refund of money you had kind of put down originally. Um, so here, the deposit is just the bond. You're putting a deposit down per unit of emissions. You're getting a refund that's not determined now, though. The refunds varying based on how bad climate change damages actually are. Climate change looks bad, you get a small refund. If it looks good, you get a big refund. You want to reduce emissions because unless climate change ends up being a zero, the refunds are only going to be partial. Um, so you're not getting the whole deposit back if you sit back and wait. Um, and you'd rather not lose some of those refunds. Um, so this is why you don't want to emit in the first place. But if you do choose to emit, now the shareholders, whoever they are, can either bet on future refunds um, and not remove carbon, 
or they can recover whatever's left by just paying to remove carbon. Um, and this is just an equivalent way to think about the policy. So you can basically pull whatever the remaining deposit back out, or you can sit back and, and just hope the future refunds are big. And we're going to be learning more about climate change, and we'll, we'll know more about those bets as, as the world comes. I'm not going to go through this in detail. I'll briefly mention I've talked about this almost as equivalent to an emission tax. You could do this through cap and trade. It's just the key is that you need to cap cumulative emissions and then have the right way of sort of issuing and adjusting shares in response to that. But instead of capping emissions in this period, you're capping emissions over all time and then changing that cap as new information arrives. But we can talk about this later if people are curious about it. I wanna conclude by emphasizing a couple of things. Um, so one, uh, when is it important to begin negative emissions? Uh, so first, if negative emissions are optimal now, it's too late. You don't have a share attached to the emissions you wanna remove. Um, and so you need to do it early when you're emitting the emissions you may ultimately wanna remove. You also wanna do it when emission controls are lax because that means you're more likely to wanna to remove today's emissions in the future. Um, put this together, and it's probably especially important to begin now, because if we wait too much longer, we're getting close to the point at which we already need to be net negative. Um, but right now, we're probably emitting carbon that we could conceivably end up wanting to pull back out of the atmosphere. Possible objections, I'll, I'll move through this somewhat quickly so we can get to Q&A and to David's comments. Um, one, will we be challenging firms' liquidity? Is this worst case social cost of carbon, this bond, is it a huge number? Well, remember first the net outlays aren't the worst case because firms get a valuable thing back. So the net outlay is still just equivalent to an emission tax, which we don't usually think of as that bad. And also, even if you're still worried about it, I do numerical experiments that I'm not showing in the talk. And I show that a reasonable bond might just be twice as large as a conventional emission price. So 60 to $200 a ton of carbon, which isn't a, an incredibly large number. Will politics interfere with setting damage charges? I have some ideas for how you can get around. This is always a problem with climate policy. And I have some ideas here about how you can kind of get around it by constraining how regulators can change charges over time where you might not be losing a lot uh, by doing these things. Um, but I can talk about it later if people are interested. The last one I want to come to um, before getting to benefits and concluding um, is, is this informationally too demanding? Um, so you have to know the worst case social cost of carbon and you have to know damages today. I want to emphasize this is less than you need to know to calculate the conventional emission price. And for a, a standard emission tax or a price in a cap and trade program, we have to project damages all, all the way out into the future in every possible state of the world uh, and then take expectations and take present value. Here, we just need the worst case damages and we need to know damages today. These are two things we have to also know to get the optimal emission price but we have to know a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So this is informationally less demanding. And I think this is a big benefit I'll come back to on the next slide. And we can actually do this from data in a way that I don't believe we're ever gonna project future climate damages from data. So this could actually be a much better grounded exercise. Hidden benefits, um, one is uh, one emphasize two in particular. The first is that this could really help the development of car removal technologies. We're establishing a larger market by providing a market mechanism that can sustain net negative emissions and not require governments to keep choosing to subsidize it. Um, and this should incentivize uh, the development of the technology through market size effects. The second that I really want to emphasize, I think this is critical, is that I've said that the regulator doesn't need to project damages all the way out into the future into every state of the world. But it's equivalent, but the emission incentives are equivalent to an emission price. So somebody's doing it. And the somebody now is the market. So in the current world, the somebody is really like me on my computer. I write papers on the social cost of carbon and what it would be. Other economists do. Economists in the EPA are doing it right now. Um, th this is, that, that is who is doing quote unquote price discovery for the right emission price, the right price in carbon emissions. Markets are really good at price discovery. That's why we have markets. This policy makes markets do price discovery on the correct price of emissions because the markets are now trying to anticipate what the future damage charges might be. Future regulators just have to look at data and figure out what damages might be. And the markets have to anticipate what those might be. And you would expect futures markets and damage charges to arise. You'd expect options markets. You'd expect the whole shebang. And now markets are working to figure out how bad we think climate change will be and to help shareholders place bets um, related to the value of a carbon share. And I think this is a really critical advantage and it differentiates it from every other proposal that I've, I've heard of or can think of in the way that, that we're now using information in a really efficient way over time 
by allowing the regulator to just look at ongoing data and making markets and all the different information that goes into markets do the work of actually thinking about how bad climate change will be. Sorry, I'll leave it up on the screen. Uh, you can read it yourself. I'll emphasize you can have an accessible write-up on VoxDU that is not as mathematical as the paper. Um, that might be a, a good thing to read if you want to see more about it. And I'm looking forward to David's comments. Thank you again for having me. All right. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, this is super interesting. Um, I, I have a a question that comes from sort of the messiness of the politics of carbon pricing. Um, and in some sense, it's just an invitation to reiterate certain things about how this all works. But I can imagine someone hearing about this proposal and thinking, wait, wait, wait a minute, what you're suggesting is that when someone puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, they get this thing that you say is valuable. And then over time, the government keeps paying them money isn't this the opposite of what we want to do right now and i know that's a it's a misunderstanding of what's going on um but how would you respond to that why is it so important that uh, you have so this dividend built into the carbon share yeah so they're getting this thing so that's a great question um and i, I think there's there's two things i want to talk about that the first is that, yeah, the government's paying the money, but the government's paying money out of the extra money they put down in the first place. So they're putting more money down than they would have under an emission price. And that extra money is part of what's going to be funding the refunds. So something you could have imagined doing and you, you would, something you might propose would be, well, instead of subsidizing carbon emissions, what if we collected all of the emission tax revenue um, as it came in or the permit auction revenue in a cap and trade, whichever one, we collect it, we put it in a lockbox, we pay a rate of interest on that, and then we're just going to fund future negative emissions out of that lockbox. Um, that, that would avoid this problem. Um, the government now is not returning money to any individual shareholder or anything, and you don't have to put down any more than the emission price in the beginning. And the problem with that solution is that the it's not using information in the same way. So the amount of money you collected is highly likely to be less than what you would actually need to fund negative emissions. So if you the, remember the emission price is your expected damage all the way out into the future. When is carbon removal gonna look most attractive? It's gonna look most attractive to go to net negative when damages end up really high. When it turns out you did the right calculation, you averaged over all possible outcomes, we just got unlucky and climate change is really bad. So after the fact, our future damages are a lot higher than we thought. The proposed policy is using information efficiently. You're putting down the most you'll ever have to pay and you're getting money back, um, provided that we're not on like the worst trajectory. But in the lockbox story, we're never getting to adjust the amount of money in the lockbox and then the difference is gonna come from the taxpayer. So the worlds in which we need carbon removal the most are gonna be the ones in which you can't just sort of collect the money today because we don't know the right amount of money. And, and this policy is a way to kind of get around that problem. Great. One, uh, another uh, carbon pricing politics question. Um, one common proposal out there for carbon taxes is that you take the money from carbon taxes and instead of saving it for carbon removal, you refund it to people to help pay for the increase in energy prices. Right. I take it that uh, this sort of proposal, especially if we implement it now, as you say, is most important, uh, would drive up energy prices. But if I'm understanding correctly, this also means that you can't use the money from the, the bonds, the deposits, to offset the increase in energy prices for households or businesses. That's um, a great question. And it gets well, to something I should think through more carefully. So the part that I have thought of is that the damage charges the regulator is pulling out, as those damages are realized, that's the regulator's money and could be refunded to taxpayers, just like emission tax revenue could have been. Um, the What I haven't thought through as much, um, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't do it, is what do you do with the money in the piggy bank while the piggy bank's just out there? And you could definitely imagine a, a version of the policy where it's not a physical piggy bank somewhere, like you're refunding the money in the meantime and then doing financial stuff just to pull it out of other government debt when you actually need to pay it back to shareholders. Like th That money could be used for something or the equivalent of the emission tax part of that money could be used for something. So I think there are ways to get around that. But at bare minimum, you do have those damage charges flowing back in that are totally yours to use and refund as you want. 
Okay. And one last question before we turn to audience questions. So audience members, if you do have questions you haven't asked yet, use that Q&A function in Zoom uh, to ask your questions and we'll start working through those. Uh, so my last question relates to this paper that you and I have been discussing before the webinar started. Uh, it was published this summer by Johannes Bedner and colleagues about the idea of a carbon removal obligation. And in certain ways, it seems very similar to your proposal. In certain ways, it's different. So I'd be interested to get your reaction to it. Uh, hopefully, I can do their proposal justice. But the, the very, very basic idea is that uh, when a company uh, emits carbon, they take on carbon debt. And in this case, it is more like corporate debt or government debt. It's a um, financial instrument. It goes as a liability in your ledgers, and you have to pay interest payments on it, uh, I think, until you pay for carbon removal to take it back. Right. So um, with that very brief sketch, I'm wondering if you can offer any comments on the, the differences between what they're proposing and what you're proposing. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So I had corresponded with Bednar and, and co-authors a year or two ago when I had first put this paper out. And I knew they were working on something, but I was unaware that they had now put something out. So I haven't read what they put out. And so I should read it. So caveat to everything I'm going to say, I don't know their proposal, but I, I'm going off basically um, the, the sketch that you're given. So as, as I hear it, I think the incentive is, is basically... So if I can first recapitulate what I think I understand. So you emit, you receive it, an instrument. Um, and what this financial instrument is, is it's basically a liability that you're now responsible for. Um, you have to pay interest on this liability over time. And you want to remove carbon to avoid having to keep paying interest in the future. And presumably, if you go bankrupt, there's some way that this thing goes to somebody else and goes to somebody else and so right. on. Yeah, they've got to find um, it. So assuming that they figure out the bankruptcy issue and not, not getting into that, I, the, the main difference that jumps out immediately is the way, again, the way that information is used. So if, in, in my case, you, the, the, I don't know how, if you're charging, in, in their version, when you're setting the debt up front, you're saying something about what the expected value of car removal is going to be in the future, because the, the entire incentive is going to be based on the interest payments on this debt. So you have to kind of make a judgment today about what's the right amount of money we're going to lock away in, or, in order to do, to, to do carbon removal 20 or 30 or 40 years down the line. Um, my version is, is very, and this goes back to like the lockbox idea I mentioned, where you could just lock emission tax revenue away and that money might not be enough. My version is very different, where you're sort of locking away the maximum amount you'd have to pay um, and then getting that money back over time as we just find out that climate change is or is not as bad as we thought. So my, I, I would suspect if we dug into it, my version is going to work a lot better in high damage worlds where we want really deep negative emissions. I suspect their version would work fine if it ends up being true that carbon removal just gets dirt cheap and you're always, will have locked, you've always issued debt enough to actually justify paying for it. But there's plenty of worlds where we want to do a lot, a lot of net negative emissions where Car removal isn't dirt cheap. It's still got a cost to it. It's just climate change is so bad, we're willing to pay a lot of those costs. And my policy will take care of that. And there's, related to that, there's two things that I want to emphasize about, about my policy that I think I, I didn't hit strongly enough in the, in the talk. I think there's an important uh, ethical component to it. So under standard emission pricing policies, and I think even to some degree under this car removal obligation policy from, from Bednar and co-authors, there, the informational burden of projecting future climate damages is borne by today's public, and the, also the risk of having to pay for additional damages, um, should things turn out worse than we expected, is again borne by the public. And in my case, the informational burden is borne by the market, because the market has to project future damage charges. And then the risk of paying for climate change for removal, should it be optimal, is again borne by the market, is borne by the shareholders. So I'm really transferring risk and transferring the informational burden away from the public and putting it on the private sector in a way that I don't see how their policy or, or others that I've heard would do that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I wanna to turn to audience Q&A. Um, we're gonna start with a really easy one for you. Have you published your work or is it available to review? Is that NBER paper, the working paper, the right one to point people to? Yeah, the MBR working paper is great. Um, the 
uh, MER working paper might behind, be behind a paywall, but there's an equivalent one on our on the Arizona website. So you can, you can find free versions. I, I think not everybody here is an economist. So I should say a couple words on how economics works and why it's weird relative to, there, there are many reasons why it's weird, but um, the, the publishing process in economics takes a long, long, long time. Um, and this is going the econ journal route. So the norm is that you put out these working papers and the works out there and people can read it and follow up on it. Well, then it ends up coming out in print five or 10 years later. Um, the journal is just super, super long lags, um, not only to get rejected or whatever, but even just to go through revisions and everything. So yes, I'm in the process of going through that, of going through that process, but it's not going to be any time in the near future. The working paper is the paper of record for, for the going <laughs> for a long going while. <laughs> All right, and I, I will drop in here uh, an answer to that question, um, a link to Derek's website. But yeah, you can find this just Googling um, incentivizing negative emissions through carbon shares, which is the title. Of the on, on my website, I have a link to both the, the NBR version and to a free version on the Arizona site. So you can find both there. Okay, great. Um, all right, then working through some of the um, questions that came in, uh, more or less in order for now. Um, one audience member asks, would it be better to frame a negative emissions model as an element of a net zero strategy? In a net zero strategy, you would be forced to address trade-offs, which would be a huge incentive for private equity and industry to invest in achieving net zero. So let me say what I think the question is to make sure I've got it right. So as, as I understand it, the question, the idea is that you, you can... I'm talking about negative emissions at like the aggregate global or national scale, but one can also fund negative emission technologies just to get to zero emissions on, on net. It doesn't have to be that you're going net negative. Um, and so I think part of the question is, is about how does this relate just to going to net zero, not to net negative. And my answer would be that this has no hitch with going to net zero, but neither does a, a common emission price, whether it's a tax or a cap. Any of these policies will incentivize negative emissions as a tool to get to net zero. The question is what kind of policy incentivizes negative emissions to go beyond net zero? If it's optimal to go to zero emissions, damages don't jump crazily once we hit zero emissions. Uh, the technologies are gonna be the same because we're gonna use negative emissions to go to zero emissions. If it's optimal to go to zero, it's probably also optimal to go to negative one or negative two or negative 100. And this policy can get you to negative whatever Whereas the standard policy has to stop at zero. It can't go any further without taxpayer money. Okay, right. Um, uh, next question is um, about whether you'd be renting or leasing the service of the atmosphere storing our emitted greenhouse gases. That's interesting language. Um, so I originally, I mentioned that one thing you could do is just tax the carbon remaining in the atmosphere. And that was actually where I started with the policy idea. Um, and I was calling that actually an atmospheric rental policy. The idea being right now we treat the atmosphere as if you, if we even have an emission tax, the idea would be like you pay an entrance fee and once your stuff's up there, it gets to stay up there forever. And if it ends up being bad, it's on us to take it back out. It's not on the emitter to take it back out. Like you've kind of given it away and put it up there. The public's bearing the risk. I was framing the, the, the taxing the carbon remaining in the atmosphere as being like renting atmospheric storage capacity. Um, you put the carbon up there and as long as it's up there, you pay a price and that price goes up if it looks like that storage capacity is harmful and it goes down if it looks like it's not. And if the price gets high, you have an incentive to stop renting and pay for carbon removal. Um, that, that simple renting policy has the problem that the person who's renting is very likely to just not be around when it, when it becomes optimal to stop renting. Um, but the carbon share is going to, the incentives function the same way in the end. It's just a more complicated way to get there. It still treats the atmosphere as something that you're renting over time. Um, and your and the rental payment is now the damage charge, and you want to to pay for car removal when those future rent payments look like they're going to be really high. When we start getting signals that climate change is going to be bad and expensive, it starts looking attractive to use car removal and avoid making those future rent payments. Great, thanks. Um, Someone asks here, your model appears to create a potential rub point where the emitter country, the developing nation, is not the consumer. Is that correct? Can you repeat the question? The, 
So uh, it says your model appears to create a potential rub point where the emitter country, in parentheses, a developing nation, is not the consumer. I'm not quite sure uh, how to interpret that. I don't know if you do or if that questioner can uh, might want to submit a. If they want to clarify, I'd be happy to, to take on the clarification. But no, I don't know exactly what they're asking. Okay. Um, while they're thinking about that, um, someone wonders if there are circumstances in which the value of a share would be different from the social cost of carbon, or are they always going to be equivalent? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the, the value of the share is not the social cost of carbon. So the, the value of, um, of not emitting is the social cost of carbon, which is the, the value of the bond minus the value of the share. The, what you show is that the value of the share is just the expected stream of dividends over time, because um, that's ultimately what you get from having a share, right? Whether you, whether you pull carbon back out or not. Um, those expected dividends all the way out into the future is the difference between the worst case social cost, the expected difference between the worst case, well, the difference between the worst case social cost of carbon and the usual social cost of carbon. So the share itself isn't the social cost of carbon, but when you subtract that from the worst case bond payment, you're left with the social cost of carbon. So the incentives are to not emit because you're effectively paying the social cost of carbon by emitting, but the value of the share is a very closely related to a slightly different object that kind of gets you the right incentive, um, if that's not too confusing. Okay. Uh, this is all conditional on the regulator behaving properly, right? Like every, every time we talk about emission prices, the correct tax, correct cap, correct share value, correct damage charges, all of this is conditional on regulators acting properly. And I try to think a little bit, I don't know that the problems of them acting improperly are any worse than this policy. I try to think through um, how you can kind of avoid that. But if regulators are just doing other stuff then like, you know, all bets are off and nothing might be the social cost of carbon in that case. <laughs> I think I did hear from here in DC, some political scientists laughing when you said, if government is acting perfectly rational. <laughs> I think it's nice to have benchmarks. <laughs> it's, uh -huh. it's nice to think how we can help try to um, tie hands to get closer to benchmarks, but uh -huh. benchmarks can be helpful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's a disciplinary um, disciplinary difference, right? Or, uh, sure, sure. Um, so the, there are a few questions here that I, I think might be interpreted as um, about social cost of carbon sure. uh, and about sort of how it's interpreted and whether to take in sort of global social well-being when a, a government entity is setting bonds. Um, but I might want to defer those for a little bit because um, uh, here's a question that sort of had, uh, connects with some of the things I've been wondering too. Uh, and the question connects this directly to slide 16, if you want to go back there. Um, it says, isn't it more likely that quick hit financial drivers will increase the rapid implementation of ineffective technology solutions? Um, so uh, I take it that the issue here is that if you've got this very high up, very high carbon price right at the beginning, instead of the carbon price that kind of starts low and ramps up, as you see in a lot of other economic models, um, is that going to give you the incentives that you want? So I think the, the carbon price that's relevant does is, well, I'm not gonna say it does, but is likely to start low and ramp up. Um, Cause the, the relevant price is what are the damage charges that I'm avoiding losing by, by paying for carbon removal now? Those damage charges are likely to be a lot lower today than they're gonna be in 10 years. And that's gonna be lower than what they'll be in 20 years and lower than what they'll be in 30 years. So the, if there were a dirt cheap removal option today, sure. I mean, if it's free to remove carbon, you might as well avoid even losing today's charges or tomorrow's charges. Um, but in 10 years, if there is a moderately attractive carbon removal technology, maybe you do it. And in 40 years, damage charges might be high enough that now, even if carbon removal is pretty expensive, it's still worth doing, or technology got cheaper in the meantime, and again, it might be worth doing. But the actual charges that you're losing, there's this quick hit big bond you have to post, but again, that what you're losing is the gap between the bond and the value of a share. That's just a standard emission price that deters emissions like usual. And then your removal incentives are determined by the charges you're losing over time, 
And in all probability, those charges are going to wrap up over time. Like we're going to see climate damages pop out of the data more and more as time goes on, not less and less. Okay. Um, that relates to directly to another question. And uh, someone would like you to say more about how the price of the bond is set. Uh, and here's some a little bit of context they give for the way they're understanding what you've said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it says global social cost of carbon is about $450 per ton as a central estimate. Uh, but the US social cost of carbon is around $50 a ton, He's citing a paper by Kate Rickey here from 2018. Um, which one would the bond cover? And what happens if, say, one country implements this approach, but others don't? Damages would be occurring, but they wouldn't be attributable to the country's own activities. Yeah, okay. So th there's, I think, a few different questions embedded mm -hmm. in that. Um, so first, I'll, I'll try to take them one at a time. So there's the pricing international and the global damages. Um, so I don't want to hang my hat on any one paper's social cost of carbon estimate, um, but as a heuristic, I, I didn't show these plots in the in the talk, but I, I did run numerical experiments trying to think about how big the bomb would have to be, and so I can describe kind of the way that's set up. It's, it's one way to think about it. Um, so the what I did was I basically allowed future damages to be uncertain, and then I look at the distribution of of carbon prices or effectively damage charges are all possible future damage scenarios. And then instead of picking the absolute worst case, which with some standard distributions could be near infinite, I basically looked at um, how big of a bond could cover the required damage charges in X percent of cases. And basically, once you got to a bond that's twice whatever the emission tax would be, um, you got to a bond that covered the any possible future sequence of damage charges in like 95% of cases. It's only like the worst like 1% to 4% of cases where you do not have totally enough money in the piggy bank. Um, and I did that both for a lower damage scenario corresponding to something like the DICE model, and I did it to a higher damage scenario, which gave a number much closer to, to Kate Rickey's paper. And in both cases, that multiplier was, pretty, was almost exactly the same, that about twice the level of the emission tax. In one case, it's a high tax and one a low tax. But in both cases, a bond about twice was basically sufficient to cover 95 plus percent of, of future possible damage charges. Um, so that, that was where I got the, the, the rough heuristic. In terms of some of the other more detailed questions, um, should the price be global or domestic? It's going to be the exact same kind of policy choice regulators have to make now. I think most economists would say the price should reflect global damages. Um, the US regulators are kind of going back to that direction now as well. Um, but it, there's nothing different about the logic of how you think about that price. Um, the same thing when you're thinking about future damages, are they attributed to one country's emissions or to the globe? Emissions are well mixed. Um, so if we're taking global damages, then we're basically attribute, you know, we can, once we've decided to use global damages, like it's all going to go through exactly like it would with the standard emission price. And you know, I'm in favor of global damages because it's a global pollutant. Last, there are questions about international coordination. And this is one thing I have not thought through thoroughly, and I think you would need to do the math to like really think through it properly, but to think about how this interacts with incentives to join coalitions on climate change or to do treaties, whether it makes it easier to coordinate on climate policy somehow or other. I just haven't gone there because I was more working through the, the basic properties of it, but I think there's interesting thought there. It could be better, it could be worse. I don't really have much to say about it. Okay. Um, so that actually ties in perfectly to uh, the clarification on that earlier question I'd asked about a yeah. case where the emitter country is not the consumer. Yeah. Um, and that question was just submitted. Uh, a clarification asking you to imagine the following scenario, right? So okay. you've got a business in a developed country. And I take it that developed country imposes this policy that you're proposing. Um, and so what the business does is it exports production of its carbon intensive good to some say developing country uh, or other country that I take it doesn't have this policy in place. So the emissions get counted there. Um, and then the developed country imports those goods. Um, well, so, sorry, here's what they say. So the developing nations export produced goods and the consumer pays for the carbon and the consumer pays a social cost, which results in a conflict between global climate policy and national policy. So maybe to, to generalize or condense that, if you want to, um, 
what happens when people offshore carbon intensive production under this policy? Right. I don't, I mean, this is a problem with essentially all domestic climate policy, sure. right? Um, I don't know that the problem is any better or worse with this policy. So in a standard emission policy, you know, one recommendation of what you could do would be like do a border carbon tax adjustment or something where you're, you try to, if you, let's just hypothetically imagine you knew how many emissions are offshore, you can put them back into the price of the product. Obviously it's a lot harder in practice, but in principle, one could do it. Um, it, it in principle, the same thing would happen here where in principle to bring the product in, you have to, to obtain shares uh, associated with the product, which would require posting the equivalent bonds, the shares are on the market and kind of everything goes as, as it would in the original scheme. Um, so it's just, it's the same exact problem we have with every policy. There's really nothing different in a good or a bad way about this policy, I don't think. Okay. Um, let's see, sorting through which questions I've uh, already asked you here. Um, so let's go back then to this is talking a bit more about sort of social cost of carbon or worst case damage scenarios in general and, and how you monetize those, right, which is essential for this kind of policy. Um, and uh, someone is uh, asking about how you figure out, how you model the social, economic, and environmental damages uh, to optimize social well-being or to calculate that bond cost. This is a great question, something I've worked on a lot and something um, that I don't think we have a perfect answer to. I, again, I want to emphasize this is not just about this policy, right? This is about literally any emission pricing policy we have to contend with. It's easier, if anything, on this policy because all we ultimately have to model are today's damages so we can actually look at some data and try to back out how, how the environment's been affected and such and put a value on that. In general, we have to not just do that, but we also have to project how things might change in the future. So this is actually a less difficult problem for, the, for this talk. But I, I do want to just offer some general thoughts. Like, I don't think we can do it. Like, I don't, we're never going to project future climate, climate damages successfully. We just haven't run the experiment. We don't have the data. I've done a lot of work trying to think about how we can figure that out. Like, how can we use uh, res responses to weather in order to figure out responses to climate? I've done work on that. I've done work on how to bring uncertainty into the social cost of carbon, and I've shown that it's a huge piece of it, especially uncertainty about damages can really strongly increase the social cost of carbon. Whether you think it should be high or low to start, you get a big adder once you account for uncertainty, and I kind of pull that apart and show why that is. So I, 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 am, I don't want to suggest that we can do this or do it well, and in part, that's why I, I am attracted to this policy because no longer is it the regulator that has to do this and no longer is it academic economists who have to do this. Now, all we have to do is figure out a way, which we don't know now, but is at least conceivable how you might do it, to look at current data on what is the economy doing? What is the environment doing? And in some way that's never gonna be perfect, put a price tag or connect that to climate change and put a price tag on it. Never gonna be done perfectly. There no, there's no one ideal way to do it. But it's at least conceivable how you might get in the ballpark right answer with that problem. And it's not totally conceivable to me how we can even know that we're in the right ballpark when it's not just that, but also now not just looking at data, but projecting hundreds of years in the future and trying to do the same exercise. I don't think we would ever even know if we're on the right track, but looking at data, you know, we do hard problems like that all the time. And we could imagine at least, you know, approximating the right answer in that case. Good. So that, that relates to something that I've wondered about in connection with a few comments you made you, uh, in responding to the objection that um, you know politics could interfere here and uh, politicians or political actors might try to sort of adjust the damages. Right. Um, you've said, well, look, the, the benefit here is that we're just looking at current damages. Um, you know, we could tie that to observable variables and, and reduce that. Um, but I wonder about setting that initial bond price, because doesn't that face all of those informational challenges that you've just suggested you can avoid, right? Because you could imagine a next administration in the United States comes in and says, well, we're projecting much, much lower damages or using different discount rates yep. or all these things yep. you can do yep. with the social cost of carbon. Yep. Um, and so now your bonds are very low. Right. Yes, that's a great question. So uh, to clarify, 
so I, I, there's two ways I think about that. So I, I agree with you that I think there's a lot of scope to tie damage charges to observables, what we actually measure as temperature and what we actually measure in the economy and such, doing things like how we crank out inflation and unemployment estimates. So like there are ways to imagine that. The bond is trickier. So first, I imagine that this would not be an arbitrary thing, like there would be a regulatory process behind this, that any revision would actually have to satisfy. So I'm sure the courts would be involved and would be supervising how it's set. But beyond that, the, I, the bond is unlikely, it's hard to imagine, uh, I mean, one could imagine stories, but in, in most likely scenarios, our judgment of the worst case social cost of carbon is unlikely to have to jump in dramatic ways from year to year. So I think if you were to either fix it for long periods or just not allow it to change by more than like X percent from year to year, like just write that into the policy and tie your hands that way. Obviously it's not maybe optimal in the, in the way if you had full flexibility, but given how high the worst case is relative to what's most likely, and given how little new information we're likely to get about the worst case as year by year goes on, like we get a lot more information about what's likely rather than relative to what's the worst possible thing. Um, I, I think that you're probably not losing a lot just by tying your hands to some degree and like writing the bond, just constraining the change or, or how it's changed in a very formal way up front. Um, the damage charges, you want more flexibility. You want the innovator to, to respond to data more, but the bond, I think I would just suggest tying your hands to a greater degree up front. Okay, great. Um, now, I know that you've got to run right at uh, half past the hour here uh, to go teach a class. So uh, just going to wrap things up here. This web, uh, webinar has been recorded. We will post the recording to the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policies website, which you can find at carbonremoval.info. That URL again is carbonremoval.info, and we usually are able to post these within a few days of the recording. So if you miss something, uh, you can go back. Uh, we've got a few unanswered questions here that we will forward on to Derek uh, in the hopes that he can answer those for us and we can post those answers along with the recording. So thank you very much once again, Derek, for joining us. This has been a super interesting conversation, uh, and thanks to everyone for uh being here with us and for your questions and thank you david uh jen and will for having me out like i really appreciate the opportunity to share this with this group and if you have further questions that don't make it into the chat in time for the email then you know feel free to shoot me an email and i'll do my best to get back to you at some point all right so great. thank you again thank you